Corporate Board Member presents an informational webcast. Hi, I'm Laura Finn, web editor of BoardMember.com, and today I'm pleased to welcome George Casey and Eliza Swan, partners at Shearman and Sterling, to the studio. Eliza, George, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank, thank you, Laura. Good to be here. This year at Corporate Board Members Annual Boardroom Summit, the two of you spoke to a small audience about current trends and issues with M&A and the corporate governance environment. So I'm happy to have you here today to talk to a larger audience about what's going on in the M&A world. What are some of the biggest challenges related to M&A right now that boards of directors should know about? Uh, Laura, I would say that if, if I were to name two things that the boards have focused in particular these days, one would be on delivering value in M&A and the other one managing conflicts. Uh, starting with value maybe first, uh, we are operating in a very difficult M&A environment. The M&A activity has been down, you know, we've seen that globally M&A is down by about 16% in the U.S. by 23% compared to the same period last year, nine months of last year. Uh, having said that, uh, we also know that U.S. corporates are sitting on about $1.3 trillion in cash. Wow. And so in a low interest environment where that cash, in fact, needs to be put to use, the fact that uh, U.S. corporates are not pursuing M&A is an, in an indication of the fact that um, uh, the companies are cautious. Boards are probably more conservative these days than, um, you know, in a stronger M&A environment. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about their own businesses. And so uh, when the companies do pursue M&A, uh, those deals are taking longer to do. Uh, I would say companies and boards in particular are very focused on due diligence. They look at operational diligence. They look at uh, financial diligence. They want to understand the different items of value and what goes into the valuation model. They are also very focused on uh, the type of diligence that maybe in the past, maybe some five, six years ago, were less of a focus for the boards, such as uh, compliance diligence, anti-corruption policies, you know, whether the, the target company, the business that they're acquiring is in fact um, a good, clean business that, uh, you know, the buyer will not inherit some bad stuff coming out of, uh, of the transaction. Uh, also, boards and management are very focused on synergies, and boards in particular uh, f uh, are focused on making sure that the management can deliver on the synergies that uh, are being promised to the shareholders. And again, back to value, given that shareholders are so focused on value, boards want to make sure that you know, those synergies are delivered. In a cross-border context, and by the way, you know, cross-border M&A constitutes about 41% of the global M&A market, so a lot of activity happening cross-border. In a cross-border context, when U.S. companies are buying businesses abroad, they're even more focused on diligence and more focused on whether synergies will be deliverable. The other area that I mentioned, managing conflicts, you know, this is area that uh, boards are particularly tuned to, um, you know, mostly given the uh, Delaware decisions recently. Um, uh, some conflicts arise out of um, somebody in the management or on the board having a, a conflict. Some conflicts arise out of uh, conflicts of the advisors. But the boards are very focused on how they manage those conflicts. Yeah, and as George alluded to, Delaware courts especially have been increasingly focused on the area of conflicts um, in recent years. Uh, and, and also, as George mentioned, we see these types of conflicts arise in two, two general types of situations. The first is one where management is going to receive an equity stake in the company surviving a potential merger. Uh, through an equity rollover, for instance. Um, and those types of situations are ones in which uh, independent directors are going to be tasked with reviewing the transaction, negotiating the transaction, all in, in view of the um, concerns and the, the benefits to unaffiliated shareholders. The second type of conflict that we see, and we're seeing it with, with more frequency now, are the conflicts that arise as a result of relationships between investment advisors and uh, the opposing party in connection with a transaction. So where this is most concerning, for instance, are situations where investment advisors to a target 
target company have relationships with the bidder and these can be as a result of past or current work being done uh, as a result of lending arrangements or shareholdings in the bidder for instance but regardless of, of the, the, the way in which the conflict arises, Delaware courts are, are very focused and have been very critical um, with respect to boards who, in, in the courts' minds, have not managed these conflicts appropriately. So I think the challenge that this presents to board members is one of both identifying and policing through the course of the transaction these types of conflicts as they come up. Because I think I've heard that every time an M&A deal is even announced, there's sure to be at least a few shareholder lawsuits filed, right? I think that's well, one right. One should expect yeah. that absolutely <laughs> litigation will be there, right? Yeah. It's uh, the unfortunate reality of, uh, of uh, the life these days in M&A. So have these challenges changed the way that board members view corporate governance in general, do you think? I think they have, and I think the, the corporate, corporate governance norms over the past 10 years have changed pretty dramatically, and I think that evolution got uh, a, a great deal of traction uh, at the time of the financial crisis and the ensuing economic uh, situation uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, as a result of, of, of the, uh, the, the drivers for this, revolu this evolution have been primarily um, external pressures that are being exerted on, on corporations in the corporate governance area to ensure that corporations are set up, fr even from a corporate governance perspective, to most efficiently uh, deliver value to shareholders. And so a lot of what's driving this is, is obviously coming from shareholders. Um, both uh, activist investors, obviously, but also not as obviously, but something that's been increasing the case, increasingly the case are um, uh, institutional investors who are getting more involved in, in governance reform and, and in some cases very actively involved in advocating for, for governance reform. So the areas of most focus in the M&A context have been, uh, for instance, a shareholders' rights plans or poison pills, classified boards, to a certain extent proxy access. But as a result of all of this, there has been a dramatic decrease over the past decade in the number of companies with um, poison pills or classified boards in place. So, so by definition, directors have been having to change the way they think about their company's corporate governance. But I also think that there's a deeper, more dynamic change going on in the boardroom that results from all of this, and that is the way in which directors interact with management and the new and different ways that they are having to find to work with management to better understand where shareholders are coming from and what shareholders' perspectives are with respect to corporate governance. And with all of that going on, is there any good news for directors in this? <laughs> I think there is. I think the one piece of good news, and, and it's, it, there are more than, there's more than one, but I think the main piece of good news here is that directors' duties haven't changed. Fiduciary duties are now what they always have been. So there's been no uh, major shift in, in the basics, if, if you think of it that way. What, what has, I think, begun to evolve is the process and the record that goes around the manner in which shareholders, in, in which directors uh, perform their fiduciary duties. And I, I would also add that in the context of unsolicited transactions, uh, also good news coming out of Delaware that uh, in a recent decision in the air gas case, uh, the Delaware courts confirmed that in fact if um, a company is a subject of an unsolicited approach uh, and that company has a robust business plan that can justify uh, the standalone value that is higher than the value that's put by, by the uh, bidder, they just can, can say no and can continue to stay uh, independent and deploy the uh, defensive measures that they have at their disposal. So, so in a way that you know th those court decisions uh, confirm that you know uh, companies can continue with their business and can continue doing what they're doing. But again, the focus is on the business plan and on the value, and that the value can be delivered. And that should be the focus, absolutely, don't you think? And that should be yeah. the focus for, for companies, and that's the focus of the shareholders. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. I do appreciate it, and I'm happy that you had the chance to share this conversation with some more viewers outside of the Boardroom Summit. Thanks, Thanks very much, so Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for watching. For more information, 
please contact George Casey at gcasey at shearman.com or Eliza Swan at eliza.swan at shearman.com. This has been a presentation of Corporate Board Member, an NYSE Euronext company.